Welcome everyone to day three of the XTC 2020 Global Competition Bootcamp. Thank you for joining us from all over the world. My name is Rajiv Rajan. I am the Chief of Staff and Head of Marketing and Communications for the Samsung Strategy and Innovation Center. I am also a member of the XTC management team. I will be your host for today. We would like to acknowledge and thank the XTC partners for their support, guidance, and in making these sessions possible. We had a superb lineup of sessions and speakers last week that included BGV, Samsung, AI Fund, Evercore, TechCrunch, Ford, NXP, and Morgan Lewis. So let's get started with our first session. Our first speaker is a co-founding managing director of a venture capital firm investing in B2B startups, Storms Ventures, and is a co-author of the Survival to Thrival series. This is Tehi Nam of Storm Ventures. He's had two successful startups, Mobile Iron, in which he's grown from zero to $150 million in annual revenues and has gone public. His talk is on Survival to Thrival, and he is here to uncover why startup growth is hard on the people and to share the keys to success. Please welcome Tehi. Tehi, take it away. Rajiv, thank you very much for uh, your uh, kind introduction. So with that, let me uh, put up the, the presentation that I would like to share with the group today. And as Rajiv mentioned, uh, it relates to a, a book that I've been working on uh, for the last four years with uh, my friend and co-author, Bob Tinker. Um, we wrote uh, two books here, um, one on um, survival to thrival, how to build an enterprise company, and the other about uh, the people side of the journey of change or be changed. And a way of sort of representing our two views is really in this like picture, where Bob, as the founder CEO, he's like a surfer. His number one job is to not wipe out, and he's fully committed to his ride to his surfboard. Whereas my, myself as a VC, I'm actually not wet. I'm not in the water. I'm more like in a helicopter about 20 feet, 50 feet above the water watching 15, 50 surfers and sort of saying, here's the wave. This is where things are going. And on top of that, it reflects our personality where Bob is the punchline guy. He just wants to know what's the practical thing to do. And where in my case, I was an applied math major in college. And so I just like models. And, and so reconciling these two views took much longer than we thought. But as we are going through and writing these books about building startups, we found that uh, there's one question that sort of exists for all startups, and that is how to unlock growth. The common answer that we see, especially as Koreans, is uh, the first one you see on the left. It's about relationships. It's about you know, playing golf getting, or going out for drinks. It's about getting to know your customer. That's great, but uh, the problem with that is you can get maybe one, five customers, but you can't scale to 10,000 customers just through relationships. The same thing that we see with founders um, being superheroes and doing phenomenal job selling, but there again, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, it's just not able to scale and get 10,000 customers. The third answer that we see here a lot is all you have to do is get product market fit. And right after you get product market fit, you can immediately go into scale mode. And, and that's where we found the problem is uh, um, that product market fit is just not enough to unlock growth. So that we've had, unfortunately, many companies where we try to scale right after product market fit. And what happens is that you miss plan, you have a high cash burn, everyone's unhappy. And what we realize fundamentally is that the companies missed a step in their journey, as you see in the diagram above. And we named this missing step go-to-market fit. What go-to-market fit is, is that it's that growth formula for unlocking growth. And that gives you scalability, predictability, and moves you on to the next phase where you're going from survival to thrival, and you're trying to accelerate to be the category leader in your category. So this obviously then raises the next question of, well, 
this is great. We just coined a new term, go to market fit, in addition to product market fit that many people have heard about. But the question is, okay, well, how do you find it? So as I work with entrepreneurs that we've invested in and trying to help them find go to market fit, um, I, I found that the challenge was explaining to someone who's never experienced go to market fit and hyper growth, um, what go to market fit actually feels like. And uh, in doing so, I found that this slide to be helpful is, is that uh, go-to-market fit feels like when you go from paddling to surfing. When you're paddling, it's so tiring. You're burning a huge amount of energy to go a very short distance. It's like burning a lot of cash to generate a little bit of growth. On the other hand, when you are surfing, you've caught that wave, what you get is you feel momentum you feel like all of a sudden, instead of exerting a huge amount of energy to go a short distance, you can go pretty far. So I found that this metaphor of uh, what go-to-market feels like is a good way of starting. And, uh, but the only thing as I went further in the metaphor is, is that actually I, I, I don't surf. I'm actually scared of the water, not a good swimmer. So I went out and uh, asked several people, including my uh, colleague at work, Ryan Floyd, who loves to surf, and so he sent me two books on Amazon, several YouTube videos. As I was going through it, I realized that to surf, you need to do three things. You need to catch the wave, ride the wave, and have the right surfboard. It turns out that finding go-to-market fit for a startup has actually those three things. Catching the wave is lining up with the urgent pain. The second, riding the wave is, requires having a repeatable go-to-market playbook, and that allows you to convert those leads. So it gives you conversion. And then the third part is having the right surfboard. It's really, it turns out, it's having the right go-to-market data model so that then it can drive execution. So let's start with catching the wave. Well, most of the companies that we see have caught the wave just by luck being at the right place at the right time with the right product, and they're, as a result, they're able to catch that wave. It turns out there's a more systematic way of catching the wave, um, but that requires something really hard, which is founder heresy, and we'll talk about that in just a second. So what I see many times is something reflected in this picture. You know, this is four surfers where once caught the wave, and three have not. The other three are so frustrated. They're so close. They can smell it. They can taste it. But they just haven't caught the wave. So this reflects like four startups, which are very close. Uh, but one ends up catching that wave, and the other three did not. So how do you catch the wave? Well, in surfing, it turns out that there are different ways of doing it. But before doing that, I want to share with you a story of a company I invested in many years ago um, who uh, basically started at Stanford the same time Facebook started at Harvard. So Facebook, you can think of, was the social networking company out of, uh, out of Harvard, and Affinity Circles was this, about the same time the social networking company out of, uh, of uh, Stanford. However, at that time, we were focused, uh, Affinity Circles was focused on um, a different use case, which is the private, private social networking. So Affinity Circles... Um, you know, obviously was an early company in this sort of whole social networking space. But through it, what we found is, is that uh, we missed three different waves of social networking. The first one everyone knows is a consumer social networking and the winner being Facebook with a market cap of 650 billion. The second is, well, taking that same concept, but just doing it for professionals. So smaller than consumer, but turns out to be a $26 billion exit for LinkedIn. The other opportunity is, well, instead of uh, just doing it for professionals, how about if we apply for companies? So each company would have their own private social network in addition to, let's say, email, chat, or other forms of corporate communications. And so like Yammer had a $1.2 billion exit. So these are three different waves that came 
related to social networking. And here we were at Affinity. We had an opportunity for each one of those, but we ended up missing each of the waves. So I'd like to explore then is how do you catch a wave? Well, in surfing, what I hear is the way you catch the wave is you paddle to the peak of the wave and then you surf with the wave. For a startup, what it needs is it needs to paddle to the urgent pain, which is answers the question, why buy now? Not three months from now, not a year from now, but why buy now? So as pointed out here is that timing is really important. You don't want to be too late. You don't want to be too early. In a sense with affinity, we uh, uh, were too early for some and too late for others. And so once you hit that urgent pain, then you want to surf with the wave. Now, as I work with companies and we try to find this urgent pain, I find that the biggest problem that we have is we have to commit founder heresy. What I mean by that is um, when people start companies, they want to focus on the founding idea. After all, the founding idea is what caused people to start the company, why seed investors invested first in the company, why early employees joined. So everyone has participating around this founding idea. And the other concept that people hear is, you know, as a startup, you have limited resources, so you just need to focus. So you see this sort of relentless focus on the founding idea when many times the urgent pain is adjacent to the founding idea. So to find the urgent pain and then pivot to it, what we found is important is that you need to cast a wider net to collect more customer data so that uh, you can overcome this sort of founding idea, the founder heresy, and then pivot the company. And that's by looking at the last 20 deals, for looking for the patterns of why you win, which deals go fast, which deals lost, which deals get stalled, and understanding the reasons and the deal characteristics behind those things. So let me give you an example. Um, since Bob and I worked on Mobile Iron, just want to share this uh, Mobile Iron example, and that is Mobile Iron's founding idea was multi OS device management, as reflected in the bullseye in this diagram. So, Mobile Iron was pushing multi OS device management as the use case, but just wasn't getting traction. So, was looking sort of in adjacent use cases. One was telecom expense management, where enterprises are trying to reduce their telecom fees. I mean, every enterprise wants to reduce fees. But then there was another urgent pain that was uh, 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 another pain that was emerging, which is executives were replacing their Blackberries with iPhones. And uh, they were going to IT and say, well, I want to switch. And IT was saying, well, we don't support Blackberries. I mean, we don't support iPhones. We only support Blackberries. Um, and then the CEO would tell the IT department, well, that's an unacceptable answer. You need to, I, you know, I want to make this switch. So that resulted in urgent pain for IT saying we have to switch and support iPhones, at least for the executives, maybe not for the entire company. And, and so what we saw there was in an adjacent area, an urgent pain, and Mobile Iron then pivoted from focusing on multi-OS device management, you know, stop going to telecom expense management, and, and just focused on initially the um, supporting, making iPhones enterprise ready. Um, and they went from then getting five new customers a quarter to 500 new customers a quarter in just a few quarters. So this is an example of, you know, trying to find that urgent pain that allows you to then catch the wave. So after you catch the wave, and it's a great feeling to catch the wave, the next step is then is to ride that wave to success. <clears throat> And, and so the key to riding a wave is having this repeatable go-to-market playbook, as I mentioned, that drives conversion. So what's the question is then becomes is what's a, a, a go-to-market playbook? So this is something that Bob pointed out when he uh, first started at Mobile Iron. This is a, a long time ago, 10 years ago in uh, 2010. He thought a go-to-market playbook was simply a good PowerPoint pitch and a lot of sales tactics. 
<clears throat> it turns out a go-to-market playbook is a lot more than that. It represents the entire operating system for go-to-market. Um, at the same time, it's not like a 30-page Bible or 60-page or 100 pages because no one reads anything that long. But usually it's about one to two pages. Many times it's just something that's on a whiteboard or on a Google sheet. Um, it's something short so that it can be easily under understood. And the target is not for executives or VCs or board members. The target is for the newest employee, for the newest sales uh, rep, the newest marketing person, by reading it, they immediately understand what the go-to-market playbook is that they need to follow. The last thing is, is that from a perspective is that uh, um, many times companies make the mistake of building a go-to-market playbook from what sales says they should do or from what marketing says they should do or product. So it's an inside-out view. Instead, a go-to-market playbook should start from the, pers from the customer's perspective, in particular by identifying the customer journey. So what is the customer journey? The, the customer journey, especially for many B2B software companies, is you look at for each ideal customer profile, so in other words, each ICP, you have to have a way of getting a lot of leads, then closing them by landing, renew, and then expand. And the playbook is simply, you know, how do you advance customers in this journey through their particular customer journey? And as I mentioned, it has to be from the customer's perspective, um, not an inside out view by, from sales or marketing. And it's important to, for the whole company to agree on the same customer journey for each ICP. Because by doing that, you can build your go-to-market data model and you need that go-to-market data model then to improve your go-to-market. But as I was working on this playbook with Bob for several years, you know, with Mobile Iron and applying it to other companies, what, what I realized is, is that this playbook really doesn't completely reflect the customer's perspective, is that what we need is for this customer journey is to have an additional step. And this last step is about how to make the customer a hero. In other words, in particular, how to make your champion a hero, get your champion promoted. And, and, and then figuring out as a result then the customer hero journey. So I'll give you an example of a company. So I was on the board of Marketo for 10 years. I invested in Marketo when there were 14 employees in the company. And uh, we exited uh, after IPO for several billion dollars. Um, so Marketo initially, um, was uh, from a product standpoint, an email marketing tool that managers of email marketing bought. However, Marketo at the same time was also teaching people how to use this email marketing tool to generate pipeline, to generate demand. And, and so um, people that were very good at email marketing then all of a sudden were able to generate pipeline and that whole area became known as demand generation. And so as a result, uh, companies were saying, CMOs were saying, well, you know, we need to generate pipeline. And so then they were looking for people that would head demand generation or directors of demand generation. So people that were early, let's say users of Marketo became then directors of demand generation. And then, Boards and CEOs were saying, well, you know, sales is having a hard time growing. What they need is they need pipeline generated by marketing. So let's look for CMOs who could generate pipeline. And then what you see then is Marketo users that learned how to use the Marketo product, learning then how to generate pipeline. And they became superstar marketers in, in that particular area. And so this is an example of how it's not about just selling more product. It's about how to make your champion into a hero so they can become promoted and as a result, big fans of the, the product as well. <clears throat> as they're doing this early on, if you can identify what I call the hero report, it's something that would really will help you in uh, um, crystallizing this customer hero journey. 
The hero report is something that one of your early champions put together um, to show that they're doing a good job. And this champ, this report gets a lot of executive attention. It then gets shared amongst executives. And by doing that, then the executives sort of tell your champion, you're doing such a good job, we're going to promote you. The early hero reports in general are made by the customer. They're not made by the product team, the CEO, or the board. But if you can find that hero report that one of your champions is using to become successful and get promoted, if you can identify it and then replicate it and share it across all the people, then in a sense, you know, you as the company, the vendor, is not just self providing a product or selling a service, but is helping your champions become superstars. Um, you know, related to that, I want to share a story. I went to a Marketo, you, you know, being on the board of Marketo for 10 years, I went to a lot of Marketo user conferences. The first one was like 25 people. And uh, I asked them, why did, are you here? Because they came from all around the world. And to my last U Marketo user conference, there were 6,000 people. And I asked this person, why are you here as well? And what she told me is, is that, you know, I, I really wanted to come to this conference so I could just hang out with the best marketers and really learn how to do great marketing. You know, she, she was about 25 years old. Uh, she just started a career in marketing. And it turns out she really wanted to come to this conference, but her company wasn't doing well, so they couldn't pay for the trip. So what she did is that she took vacation time got a free admission from the Marketo sales rep and stayed with her colleague so she could just come out and learn how to become a superstar in your area. So this whole idea of helping your customer in their hero journey is something that's very powerful and uh, is, you can see is being done by whether it's Marketo with Marketo Nation or Salesforce with Dreamforce. You know, these major events is a way of helping customers in their hero journey. The other part is as you're going through the customer journey is, is that for each step of the journey, there's an, a critical element. So as I mentioned for the hero stage, it's about getting promoted, but early on about in the lead, to get leads, you need to find that urgent pain that causes customers to say why I want to buy now and not later. Otherwise, you know, what you get are a lot of cold leads. So for lead, you need the urgent pain. To land, you need to show wow, and I'll talk more about wow in just a second. And then to renew, you need to show value. And then for expand, it's about becoming strategic. So in the land, let's talk about the wow. The wow is something that causes potential customers to move to the next step of the journey. In other words, it's something that, let's say a demo, a screenshot, uh, a slide you show and your customer says, you know, I, I want my colleague to come in and see it. Or they say, I want to give it a try, or I want my boss to see it. It's, it's something that causes customers to take that specific action. It's not something that, let's say, your product team says is the best feature or what investors love or what board members think is compelling. It's something that's determined by the customer and it causes them to take an action. In Mobile Iron's case, the wipe was, the wow was selective wipe. It was the ability for IT to wipe corporate data from the phone while leaving all the personal photos, personal data there. It was actually a trivial feature. It took engineering just a few days to build it, so they weren't that excited about it. Product team thought it was trivial, but really wild IT and when they saw it they said you know I, I want my colleague to see it and I want to try it to see if it really works and at that time it's what really drove conversion and that's the other thing related to the wow is that it's very specific to that particular time um, to help in the process uh, uh, we've shared you know th several different playbooks um, one is uh, SendGrid, which is an example of a product-led go-to-market. Another Marketo, as we were talking about, a marketing-led go-to-market. And then also, obviously, Mobile Iron, which is a, a sales-led go-to-market. 
So what this repeatable go-to-market playbook allows you to do is find and win the same type of customers by matching the, the customer journey. And what that feels like is its ability to ride the wave. So now let's talk about the third, which is having the right surfboard. And as a, to me, having the right surfboard is getting the right go-to-market data model. And what that allows you to do is really drive execution. So why is execution so hard? The, it, the answer is pretty simple, is that it really comes down to people. And it turns out that it's much harder than it seems, but driving cross-functional integration across these different teams to implement this go-to-market playbook turns out to be much harder than it seems. And the reason for it is that each team works in silos, you know, whether you're marketing, whether you're sales, customer success, everyone's got their own metrics, everyone's got their own objectives, they're working hard, but in silos. So as a team, it's not really optimized for cross-functional integration. Um, <clears throat> so what's the answer? Well, we all know the answer. Um, we hear it all the time is you just align and drive teams by setting the right goals and reporting the right metrics, in particular at every board meeting. But how, how do you do it? So I'd like to propose a, a, a way that I think works for companies that, let's say, have a, a sales in their go-to-market, which is let's start with what sales should report to the board. And, and I share this picture because uh, um, on one hand, Sales, if they make their quarter like a couple of times, the, the VP of sales will get fired. So the sales team, in particular the VP of sales, feels tremendous accountability and need to make in the quarter. However, to succeed, like here, uh, the harpooner needs the support of everyone else in the boat. So it's not a personal task or just a sales only task, even though it's highly magnified for sales. So I want to start, share with you is, <clears throat> excuse me, if I were a VP of sales, what slides would I include in my board deck? Or if I were a CEO, what slides I would require the VP of sales to present? And what you're going to see is, is that in order to provide these slides, you know, to create these kind of reports, you'll need a common go-to-market data model. But the three questions I want the VP of sales to answer would be, am I going to make this quarter, this quarter? Am I going to make next quarter? And what support do I need from others because of the integration problem? So in terms of making this quarter, we'll provide two views. One is a pipeline view, which is shared by this, which is what's my pipeline at the beginning of the quarter? What new pipeline am I going to create this quarter? What's my conversion percentage? I multiply those two together, and then that gives me a forecast. But beyond that, what I would do is I would actually include prior quarters, ideally going a year back to show seasonality, but to show prior quarters to see whether the forecast, to test the forecast accuracy um, and also reasonableness and show trends. And the other here then is to drill down on the pipeline conversion percentage, like why is it going up? Why is it going down? Uh, what it should be by looking at the major contributors to pipeline conversion, which is, you know, is my sales cycle going up or down? Is my win rate changing? Um, do I have now two, is uh, most of my sales reps uh, uh, mostly new reps, so I lose efficiency? So I look at what percentage of my sales capacity is new reps, or am I just generate getting poor pipeline quality? So drilling down into the reasons why uh, the pipeline percentage is uh, changing. The second view is from a sales rep perspective. So as I mentioned, I'm forecasting this quarter through the pipeline, and then the other is by looking at sales rep uh, capacity. And so in particular, I'm looking at, you know, what is my new ARR based on my sales rep uh, sales capacity? So if my capacity is like $50 million a year, a quarter, and I can hit 80% is what I expect, then that would forecast 40 million. And comparing that to the plan, um, to 
then calculate the sales capacity. You need to know the number of AEs, the ramped AEs, the ramp time it takes for an AE to become ramp. And then um, you need to understand the quota as well because quota times AEs, I mean, is your sales capacity. So you need quota, you need AE to calculate your sales capacity. Um, and then related to quota uh, is a way of test. You want to test whether or not the quota makes sense. And so you see uh, something like quota economics, which is what is the quota related to the AE full compensation? Because if that's one, then you're not going to make money. It should be about three to four to one. And then lastly, what percentage of your AEs are making quota? So your sales quota attainment number. So a way in which whether you can see whether your sales engine is working and whether you have a, a reasonable forecast for this quarter. And then the other is, you know, am I going to make next quarter, which really comes down to, am I generating enough pipeline for the future? And so I'm looking at uh, uh, my three different ways of generating pipeline, whether it's inbound, outbound, or other like through partners. And inbound is mostly by marketing. Um, outbound is mostly by sales. And partnering would be through business development. I mean, we have companies like 80% of their uh, pipeline is generated by inbound or by marketing. And, and so understanding what those ratios will be is important. And then the next is obviously, am I generating enough pipeline? Two things that are also related to this is, that's helpful is asking the question, is my new pipeline high quality? And you just measure that by saying, you know, what is the, the conversion of that cohort of pipeline? And if it goes down, that means your quality is going down. If it's going up, that means your quality is going up. And then lastly, looking at, you know, are you generating so much new pipeline, you need to hire more AE. So you look at your new pipeline you're generating per AE. If that number is going up, then you should start hiring AEs. If it's going down, then you're start, you will start having very unhappy AEs and you're going to start missing your number. Um, the third thing that would present because you know, sales, even though it seems like something it's controlled by them, it's really a team sport, is looking into, you know, what do I need from the other members of the team? So as I mentioned, marketing drives inbound, which drives a lot of new market, uh, pipeline generation, but they also do product marketing. You know, what do you need from product, customer success? Like if you don't get good references and referrals from customer success, it's also hard to sell. So just figuring these things out and see whether or not the rest of the team is making progress. I know this is a bit controversial because it seems like finger pointing, especially at a board meeting. So hopefully uh, it's not the first time the other execs have seen it at, at the board meeting. However, as a board member, it's really important to understand, you know, what support sales needs for the rest of the team and also whether the rest of the team is working seamlessly with sales or pursuing other agendas. Um, but as we're putting this together and trying to uh, see it as a company and then understand it as a board, we have a problem because each team uses different metrics and different definitions. Um, and that's why it's so important here for this to work is to have a common go-to-market data model um, so that then you can see whether each of the functions then are working seamlessly correctly for the go-to-market. Um, to learn more about go-to-market uh, data models, I want to share this blog post that Yako Winning by Design wrote, which I thought was really helpful, the SaaS uh, data model. Um, Winning by Design is a firm we work closely with and we help Yako start uh, as well. But at the end of the day, the common data model, what it really means is you just need to track your entire customer journey and it just needs to be consistent across your functions. So if you can do that, you can have this common data model. And what this common data model allows you to do then is it provides that surfboard so that the rest of the team can then ride the wave and then execute on the go-to-market playbook. To summarize then on this whole idea of surfing to go-to-market fit, as I mentioned, is you gotta catch the wave, which is lining up with this urgent pain, ride the wave, which is this repeatable go-to-market playbook, 
and then having a, a right surfboard, which is this go-to-market data model. And so the, the challenge in finding this urgent pain is you have to overcome founder heresy, and you do that by casting a wider net, and that will generate leads. To f- develop the right go-to-market playbook, you have to overcome this internal bias, identify the customer journey, and the wow and the hero board, and that will drive conversion. And to build your go-to-market data model, you have to overcome silos and it helps to find, get the right board reports. And so as a result, that will then uh, uh, drive execution. Um, So with that, go-to-market fit unlocks growth and capital. So I want to talk quickly about the other topic uh, which is that there's a certain downside of growth. So we spend all this time about unlocking growth, but there's a major downside, which is it, it will result in superstars failing. It's a very humbling experience where people that were superstars at one stage, unfortunately, will then struggle and fail at the next. And the reason for it is pretty simple, is that as a company grows, the company changes, even though the role title and the role changes, even though the title of the role doesn't change. And so people have to change or be changed. In other words, being VP of sales with five reps is very different than a VP of sales with 5,000 reps, even though their title could be the same. So people will need to change or, or be changed. Um, So I just want to talk about a couple of examples of how roles change. One is a profile of the ideal CEO. So in the beginning, the ideal CEO is a Captain America or a Wonder Woman type, a person who just leads by example, one of the troops, you know, in the trenches, you know, leading by example, knows everything, decides quickly. It's fantastic but it only works to about 25 at most 50 people. And with that, you need to transition to a new type of CEO um, where the CEO is like uh, uh, um, uh, leading a band of Avengers because you know, you're looking for a VP of sales with a superpower. You're looking for each VP with a superpower who's actually better than the CEO in that area. And then as the company gets even bigger, you're looking for now a CEO who's leading, let's say, a, like Professor Xavier, a dean of a university, and uh, um, where vision and culture become much more important. And, and so he, the way uh, that a CEO runs the company will be very he, different. This is, yeah. this is Rajiv. Yes. yes. Um, yeah, we have about five minutes left. So we wanted yes. to give the audience a chance to ask you some questions also. Sure. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So, that sounds great. All right. Thank you. We have two questions that came in. Uh, one is from JP Ellis. Um, his question is, can we get some clarification on founder heresy? What does that mean? Right. So founder heresy, what I mean by that is, is that when you're thinking of something other than the founding idea, the founding idea is why people started the company, what people want to do with the company and so forth. So pivoting away from the founding idea sounds like heresy. And so that's what I meant by founder heresy. Thank you. Um, and we have a question from Mohammed Farhari. And his question is, is go-to-market fit different for a hardware company than what you have already explained? Uh, there are, the concept is the same, but uh, uh, how you find go-to-market fit is a little bit different, yes. But the whole concept of go-to-market fit and that you want to find it before you scale is, is the same. Got it. Thank you. Um, anybody else, if you have any questions, please use the raise hand feature and um, feel free to ask the question and introduce yourself. Um, in the meantime, we have another follow-up from Muhammad. He says, how different is it? So his is a continuation of the question about the hardware company versus others. Right. Um, it, it's, uh, um, it, it, it's, it, it depends for hardware, you know, it, it, 
it, it also de- going into the different kind of things. Like, for example, if you're providing a semiconductor chip for hardware and you're going for the design win process, um, you know, you, you have to go in and, uh, uh, and finish the entire design win before you can scale. So from hardware, you have more of a, uh, of a heavy design win than, let's say, a self-serve software that you can just try and see if you like it or not. Got it. And Tehi, another question. Do you have any specific advice for companies that have both B2B as well as B2C sales? When you say B2C sales, I'm assuming it means self-serve. JP, um, do you want to clarify your question? Yes, self-serve. Yes. So I view self-serve as a, a, like a product-led motion, basically. So I don't call it B2C sales, but it's just another type of B2B, but uh, uh, pro- is a product-led. And uh, um, many B2B companies now are using that as their primary go-to-market. And it's very effective in going from like zero to 50 million. But as you got, get larger and you want to go into more enterprise deployments, then uh, sales becomes even becomes important. Elon, did you have a question for? Yes. Uh, thank you for the excellent talk. Uh, one of the slides, which I guess will be interesting for most of us, is the one about the qualities of the CEO which where you described three very different types of uh, CEOs along the evolution of the companies. Um, Given that uh, some big companies began with founders who did all the road from a idea to a big company, Microsoft, Alibaba, Amazon, Facebook, I can go on and on. Um, How do you evaluate in the different funding grounds, the qualities of the CEOs? What are you looking for? That's a, a, a great question. So, you know, it, it really goes back to um, this right here is as the company grows, you need very different profile of CEOs. So that asks the questions, can your CEO change? But the best is when you have executives who can change themselves and then grow as the company grows. Um, you have that any is a, the, to check it? Pardon? Do you have any methodologies to check it as part of your due diligence? Yes, we, we try to do that by looking for certain traits. Um, the, the first thing is, uh, uh, it turns out that change is incredibly hard because uh, in particular, you have to unlearn what you're so good at. And so the first question is, uh, uh, is the person self-aware? You know, some, if you have no self-awareness, it turns out it's very hard to unlearn and change yourself. Um, the second thing is, is that uh, um, related to it is that, you know, they need motivation. So it's really about passion for the mission rather than I just want to be CEO. And uh, with that, uh, because we've run up to the hour, we'd have to move to the next session. But Tehi, um, fantastic talk. And if anybody in the audience would like to get in touch with you or Storm Ventures, how can they do so? LinkedIn is the best way. And, and also, I'm happy to share the presentation or the sample VP of sales presentation that people want. Just reach out for me on LinkedIn. Thank you so much, Tehi. Appreciate it and sharing your insights.